Okay, so for the rest of the semester, we're going to be focused on this idea of a program effect, which is the difference in outcome for somebody who went through your program and for somebody who did not go through that program. And ideally, it should be the same person. Um, but we don't have time machines, so we have no way of actually measuring that. Um, and because we don't have time machines, what we need to be able to do is talk kind of legally about this notion of causation um, and be able to isolate the effect of your specific program on one person's change in outcome. And that gets really, really, really hard. And so in order to do that, we need a special language for talking about causation. Um, and that is what this idea of causal models allows us to do. It's a, it's a new language for talking about causation. And this is important um, because um, there are a couple different ways of measuring that program effect. You can have experimental data where you have total control over who gets treatment. So you might have some nonprofit that you're working for and they have some new program they want to roll out. Um, they could run a randomized controlled trial and have a lottery to see who gets access to the program and who doesn't, and then measure the difference between those two groups with their outcome, and then you can isolate that program effect. That's great. We love experimental data because um, we have a more plausible story for that program effect. Um, with observational data, you don't have control over who gets treatment. So you might have a nonprofit that just starts rolling out a program and anybody can sign up for it. Um, and then you could arguably say, let's measure the effect or let's measure the outcome in people who did the program. And then let's measure the outcome for people who didn't do the program and subtract that and figure out the, the program effect. The issue there is that the people who didn't participate in the program are fundamentally different from the people who did. They, the people who participated self-selected into it. Um, so there's something different about them. And so we can't really kind of, um, logically say that they are the same, that, that is the exact program effect. And so often what happens is there's kind of this gold standard for experimental data. Um, and um, if we were in person, we would talk about this here. What kind of data, experimental versus observational, lets you prove causation? Um, and lots of you would say only experimental um, because with observational data, everybody's selecting into the programs and so we can't actually measure program effect. Um, and so can you prove causation with just observational data? Um, maybe, um, but it is hard to do. Um, maybe is, is too weak of an answer. Yes, that is the whole purpose of this class, um, is showing you different ways of measuring causation with just observational data, um, because often you can't run these experiments. Um, it might be unethical to roll out a new social policy to only some people for the sake of science. Um, that would not be great. Um, and so you can't often get perfect experimental data. Um, and so instead, we want to use observational data because it exists and it's really tempting to just use it. Um, and as long as you do things correctly with it, um, and don't just infer causation based on correlation, but if you can use the language of causal models that we'll be talking about here, then you can kind of legally talk about causation using observational data. This is a newer thing in the social sciences, and lots of people kind of get wary about this um, and scared, including people who have been doing this for, for a long time. Um, there's this fun pair of tweets here from a few months ago. Um, where this researcher here, um, she works on causal inference with observational data. That's her whole field of research. Um, and they were publishing a book and the editors in the book yelled at them for talking about causation using observational data, saying stuff like this. Causal language should only be used for randomized clinical trials for other study designs. Only talk about association or correlation. Don't say cause and effect. The whole point of this book was to talk about how to talk about causation using observational data, but it's so ingrained in us to avoid causation um, that like a book that's designed to, to refute that is, is kind of getting yelled at for that. Um, and there's this whole field also of like people over relying on randomized control trials. You don't always need randomized control trials for everything. So um, this, this joke derivation of this tweet here saying like, a normal person would see that it's raining and then say that is causing me to get wet. Um, but if you're a hardcore RCT person, randomized control trial person, you can't say that. You can't talk about causation. You have to take a whole bunch of walks and randomly apply the, the rain treatment and then see if there's an effect. 
But that seems ridiculous because we, as humans, are pretty good at figuring out cause and effect. Um, that's why we're good at, like, we're one of the best animals because we can figure out cause and effect. Um, so don't be afraid of looking at observational data and trying to figure out causation from that observational data as long as you follow specific rules to do so. Those specific rules come from what is called the causal revelation, or revelation, the causal revolution, um, which is this idea that you can use specific logical um, rules to infer causation from observational data. Um, it's based on a whole bunch of research um, that has been going on for decades. Um, one of the most famous people in this field is this guy here named Udaya Pearl. Um, his book, The Book of Why, is kind of the most accessible version of his stuff. Most of his papers are extremely technical, um, full of all sorts of like proofs and calculus, and they're really hard to read. Um, I don't like reading them because it goes way over my head. Um, the Book of Why, if you're interested in this stuff, is way more accessible. It's, it's easier to read. It's fun. Um, I recommend checking that out sometime. But the main... Um, concept at the foundation of this whole causal revolution is the idea of a causal diagram, um, which has a specific definition of, a, it's a diagram that is a directed acyclic graph, or a DAG. So we'll talk about DAGs for the rest of the semester here. Um, each of the letters in the acronym means something. Directed means that you have a whole bunch of nodes here. So you can say that X causes Y. Every arrow means that there's a causal relationship. So X causes y. There's an arrow pointing between x and y. Um, every node that you include here has to have an arrow either going into it or coming out of it. Um, and so that's the directed part. Acyclic means that you can't cycle back. So if you start at z and you say z causes x which then causes y, you can't also have an arrow that says y causes z because now you have a cycle. Um, and so you can't do that. You have to start at some node and you can't get back to that node. Um, that's the whole acyclicness of these graphs. The G in the acronym stands for a graph. Um, it's a causal graph here. So if you look at the picture here, X causes Y, Z causes X, and Z causes Y. So that's what we are talking about when we, we talk about these causal graphs. It's just a collection of nodes with arrows pointing um, and connecting all of the different nodes. Um, a couple important things. The reason this is important is um, in the very first session, we talked about this idea, be the, the difference between correlation and causation. And we said that there's no mathematical test for correlation or for causation. We do have a correlation function in R and in Excel, and you can get an actual number that ranges between negative one and one. But we don't have a correlation or a causation function that says this thing is causal or 62% causal or anything like that. Causation instead is a philosophical model of how you think the world works. It's a philosophical question. The reason DAGs are so important and so critical for thinking about causality is that it is a graphical version of your philosophical model. It maps your theory of how the world works into something that is graphical. And then why that's important is you can use something called do calculus, um, which we'll talk about next session, um, or essentially some fancy mathematical and logical rules that let you isolate specific relationships. And so in this graph here, if we care about the effect of x on y um, on our program causing some sort of outcome, um, we want to isolate that relationship. There might be other things that cause the program. There might be other things that cause the outcome. And so our goal is we want to have as complete a graph as possible that shows how people um, get the program and how people um, or what causes different outcomes. And if we can isolate this one arrow using these do calculus rules, then we can talk about causation. If we can get rid of all of the confounding um, effects and other effects that might be distorting the relationship, if we can isolate that x to y arrow, that is the causal effect that we care about, and that is our program effect. So that is the goal for the rest of the semester, is, trying to, is going to be to isolate this arrow between x and y. A um, couple other final things about these causal graphs. What if you have something in your 
philosophical model that actually really is cyclical. Um, there are things that are cyclical in life. You might have wealth, which leads to political power, which then leads to more wealth, which then leads to more political power. And so it'd be really tempting to draw arrows between both of those. I'm um, saying wealth causes power, power causes wealth. Um, the issue with doing that is that this is no longer acyclic. If you have a causal graph, you could start at power, you could go to wealth, you can end back up at power. So you don't want to do that. Um, the easiest way to make it so that it still is acyclic, if you have um, a cyclical thing in your graph, is to split that node, if, or split the nodes, if it's wealth and power, into separate ones based on time. Um, so you might have wealth at time period, at the previous time period, so maybe last year's wealth causes this year's power, which then causes this year's wealth, which then causes next year's power. Um, or something. And so this, this T subscript here, that just means time. So T minus one is previous time. So this is really just like previous wealth causes power, which causes wealth, which causes future power, which causes future wealth, etc. So it, it, you might be tempted when you're writing these, these DAGs to have bidirectional arrows, but don't do that. Just split the nodes so that you always have kind of acyclicality. Um, so how do you actually draw these things? Um, so we're going to walk through an example of how to do this. And then in your assignment next week, you'll actually do this um, in real life um, with a couple different um, programs and other social phenomena that you'll look at. Um, so for this example, we're going to ask this question. What is the causal effect of an additional year of education or college education specifically on your earnings? Um, economists love this question. And we'll be returning to this question throughout the semester when we talk about instrumental variables, when we talk about difference in difference estimation. Um, there are so many papers about the causal effect of education on earnings. So get used to this question. It's everywhere. It's just kind of the stereotypical question. Um, so if we want to draw a DAG for this relationship, we have to do a few things. The first step is to list all of the different variables that might influence education and that might influence earnings, and that might influence both. Then we want to simplify that down because we're probably going to list a ton of things. And so pick kind of the most important things, the things that aren't overlapping. Um, then your job is to connect all of the different arrows between these nodes. So you can say that this thing causes education, and then education causes something, and then something causes earnings. Um, you want to connect all of the different arrows that you that kind of relate these different variables. Then the final step, and what we'll focus on the most um, next week, is you use logic and math um, to determine which nodes and which arrows you should focus on, and which things need to be controlled for, and which things do not need to be controlled for. Um, this is going to be very helpful because in your past stats classes, um, when you run a regression model, even in this class um, for problem set two, um, I had you just throw in a whole bunch of different control variables for fun um, when you were looking at the effect of or the relationship between a whole bunch of different variables and mortality rates. Um, and that's kind of the standard way of doing stats is just throw in a bunch of uh, control variables, see what happens, try to get a cool R squared and call it good. Um, with causal inference, we don't care about that. What we care about most is isolating that one specific arrow between X and Y, or our program and our outcome. And in those situations, you don't want to just control for everything. You have to control for very specific things. And these causal graphs tell you what you should control for, which is why they're so great. So some examples of that. So um, with step one, we want to list all of the different things that might cause education and might cause earnings, or both. Um, and so here's a bunch of different things. The location where you're born might cause um, certain levels of education because you'll get into specific high schools or you'll be close to a, a, a college that is good or bad or whatever. Um, that also causes earnings. Your ability to go to school and take tests influences both of those things. Demographics, socioeconomic status, the year you're born. If you're born in a year that 18 years later or 22 years later, there's a huge recession, that's going to stink for your earnings. Um, compulsory schooling laws cause you to get education. Um, that's why you go, because they're, you're required to get education. Job connections helps you with earnings. 
Um, education might cause those job connections. You're going to network with people. You're going to meet new friends, and they'll know people. And so um, job connections can um, cause earnings, but those are caused by education. Um, so then we want to simplify some of these things. Um, so we could probably wrap ability, demographics, and socioeconomic status, wrap all of that into something that we could call like background. Um, it, none of these things necessarily have to be a column in a data set or something that is easily measurable. Um, these are just things that, um, they're phenomena that cause other things to happen. Um, it'd be great if they were measurable, but they don't necessarily have to be measurable. So we're going to collapse all of these things into something we call background, um, however we want to measure that. And if we were doing this in real life, we then go through the, the ladder of abstraction and figure out what background actually entails and how we want to measure that. Um, step three is we start connecting arrows. So we're going to say that education causes earnings. That's our main question. That's the thing that we think exists. We want to measure that causal effect. So then we start adding all of the other variables that we listed. So we could say that required education causes you to get education. The year you're born causes you to get education. Location you, you're born in causes you to get education. Your background causes education. So all of those things link up directly to education. Um, but we can also connect other arrows. We can say that the year you're born causes you to get earnings. Again, if you're born in a year um, where 22 years later there's an awful recession, that's going to greatly influence your earnings. Um, the location you're born in causes earnings, background causes earnings, and the job connections that you have um, causes your earnings. If you have kind of a, a greater social network, um, you might have better opportunities to get a good job and, and have better earnings. Um, Education causes job connections, which then causes earnings. And so we can link those things as well. We can even include nodes in this graph here that aren't measurable. For instance, um, something causes both your location of birth and your background, something that's unmeasurable or unobservable. Um, institutional racism causes where lots of people are born, which then causes other things downstream. History, U.S. history causes all sorts of things here. That's not going to be a column in your data set. Um, even if you could have a column in a data set for an unmeasurable thing, maybe it's actually not measured, like it's unobservable. So you can include these things that, that aren't actually measurable, but, are, but still fit in your causal model here, in your philosophy of what causes education and earnings here. Um, and so what you're left with in the end is a graph that looks like this. It has all sorts of nodes, has all sorts of arrows. Nothing is cyclical. If I start at year, I can't end back up at year. If I start at unobserved stuff, I can go to location, I can go to earnings, but I can't get back to job connections, I can't go to education. Like There's no way to get back to any of the nodes that you start at, which is good. That means it's acyclical. And it's a graph, so it's a DAG. Um, to do this on your own, you can actually let the computer do this for you. You could draw this um, by hand. Um, if we were in person, we would do this on a whiteboard and we'd be in different groups drawing different DAGs. Um, doing it on a whiteboard is good initially, but then if you start rearranging these nodes, then it gets messy because you have to redraw the arrows and, and it's awful. So you can actually let the computer do this for you. Um, there's a website called daggity.net that lets you draw DAGs. Um, it's different from the other um, drawing apps that you used for your logic models. With your logic models, um, you were able to draw boxes and, and squares and circles and stars and stuff, and you could link them with arrows and you could drag them around, and that was great. Um, you can draw DAGs with those too. Um, the advantage of doing um, the DAG drawing with Daggity is that it is specifically made for these causal graphs, which means it can do all of the math and the logic behind the scenes. And it will tell you what variables you need to control for and what paths you need to, to deal with to isolate your cause and effect. The other drawing apps are just general drawing apps. They don't have the ability to isolate causal effects. Daggity is designed to do that. There are also functions in R that let you draw these DAGs. Um, all of the, the pictures in the slides here, these were drawn with the ggdag package in R. Um, on the examples, or in the examples section, um, there are some extra resources and guides. 
um, where I walk through how to make a DAG in Daggity and how to make a DAG with ggdag. Um, so check those out if you want to, to see exactly how you create these things. Um, but that is why, like, this is how we create DAGs. We care about these a lot because it, it encodes our philosophy of how the world works in kind of a graphical form. And then it tells us what we need to do to isolate the causal effects that we care about. And that's what makes these things super powerful is because we can finally rely on observational data to make causal inferences if we can't run experiments. And so this is super important stuff, um, super exciting stuff. And so it should be fun to do.